day, good day, or oh, good evening, and welcome to uh, another webinar hosted uh, by Chiba Cannabis Academy and Marijuana SA, and we're presenting to you guys the Shining a Light on Cannabis, and we've got a very, very, very interesting show with amazing experts who are going to give you guys some insights in the world of lighting. So uh, my name is Nina Sibodo, and I'm one of the co-founders and directors of Chiba Cannabis Academy. And I would like to bring on our host for today is Andrew Fort, Forte uh, from Marijuana SA. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing? Hey, thank you so much for having me here tonight. And I am absolutely thrilled to be speaking about LEDs tonight. And I've got some really cool questions lined up. And most of all, I think we've got some really, really knowledgeable guests uh, waiting uh, to join us a little bit later. Awesome. Um, just before we start our panel, I'm going to first have a, we're going to first have a quick um, interview with uh, Kaya from uh, Indo Sun, who's just going to interface here with, uh, with Andrew. Kaya, can you please come to the stage? Cool, man. I'll be off. I'll How's see you guys later. How's it? How's it, brother? Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm going to be off now. I, I ho hope you guys have a lecker chat and I'll see you guys soon. Thanks, Linda. Hey Kaya, uh, thanks so much for, uh, for some time tonight to uh, share your knowledge with everybody that's uh, come around. Um, if you could in just a few seconds, give us a quick understanding, uh, a little bit of an intro on Indoor Sun. Uh... Sweet, no problem. Um, so Indoor Sun is a brainchild for myself and my co-owner, um, Alan, which is also my dad, which is super fortunate. We get to take this journey sort of together. Um, so we started out quite humble, you know, uh, we used to basically do um, one light to get the test, to get all the imagery and things like that, to basically prove a concept that we knew fair and well was the best in the market. Um, so we've managed to do um, quite a um, few facilities um, since we began, which is really, really cool. Like the insights you get from these master growers and the people on the floor, there in Lesotho and a couple of places up here in Johannesburg is unreal you know, what the guys are actually getting right. Um, so it's awesome to see, um, like for one example, our future med site, the guys are harvesting it right over there. Um, a very nice cheese strain. Um, so they've got something like 3000 plants over their tables. To see something like that in full flower is just unbelievable. You know, and us being from Joburg, we love a strong, you know, sexy <laughs> cheese. And that's just what it was. We were fortunate enough to get a couple samples from some of the guys up there. So very, very cool, you know. So really, really really? We, we, we busy boys we're trying to push the boundaries you know we're also part of a, a podcast called the green lab sessions where we're pushing education breaking stigmas working with a couple you know local artists and rappers and such you know to really get it out there and show people what cannabis in south africa is all about you know we're trying to be part of the community we're trying to evolve with everybody we love to work together and we've got a strong passion with team Fantastic. Yeah, it's nice that, uh, uh, I mean, I've, I've been around a while and I remember you guys right from the beginning uh, and it's nice to see you guys grow throughout the time. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you guys have one uh, sort of distinguishing factor. I mean, amongst the other uh, uh, um, guests tonight is that you guys obviously, among the others, have a proudly South African angle um, that you're going for. Uh, if you could just elaborate a little bit on that. Um, so we work with our uh, partners, Giant Light, who have been manufacturing LEDs in the country for 30 plus years. You know, Otto took over from his dad. I um, mean, to see that family evolution is very similar to what myself and Alan do. We're really a family community base, you know. Mm. So these guys have been pushing out high quality finished products for big places, showrooms, etc., malls, just massive scale. So we came from a humble beginning of trying to do solar PV, sort of doing the right thing having a passion with the cannabis, you know, brought us to Otto and the guys. And we wanted to push that initiative, that proudly South Africa, you know, and get it assembled and made, you know, with a, to compete with all these overseas brands because we saw the gap and we thought, yeah. you know, let's give it a go. And it's it's just evolving, you know. We're constantly innovating and moving forward. So it's, it's proper. Yeah, it's, it's something uh, the other guys, uh, the other guests tonight are going to have to... Uh, bear with me if at any, any point I get a little bit uh, passionate, but I do have a strong um, passion about local uh, lights. It's a difficult one because the lights aren't, uh, we'll get into the technicals about it, but you guys are doing the right thing by, by pushing through and it's a difficult grind to get 
where you're going oh, in the lighting okay. space in, in South Africa. We're South Africa. We, we uh, like our legislation, we're miles behind um, the rest of right. the world. You know, manufacturing isn't at the standard uh, or isn't at the, uh, we haven't had as much time to develop it and invest in those equipment. So the fact that you guys have the equipment, the same stuff that they're using overseas, uh, to be doing it locally is is pretty incredible uh, and yeah for all the guys doing lighting in SA it's it's really commendable um, yeah and I, I might I might go on about this quite a bit <laughs> yeah but it's impressive the facility the guys have managed to generate over time like those two mm. pick and place machines watching them operate at full throttle is yeah. <laughs> even if you don't know what you're looking at you're like yeah. shit this is good <laughs> you know <laughs> It's, it's, it's really nice to see their, you know, evolution as well, because those guys, I mean, Otto is probably like, you know, the encyclopedia of lighting. When you sit in that room with a man, he's on it. Like any question you ask him, he could probably teach it. You know, he's just so knowledgeable. So when developing new products and stuff like that, he's on the ball. So, I mean, really, really fortunate to have those guys in our corner. And then uh, just uh, last thing, do you guys have any uh, upcoming projects or anything uh, uh, that um, you so can currently give us doing a, a project about? Right now, um, Al's busy doing an installation there in Lesotho. I'm not sure if we can mention the name. Do you think? No, no, I don't mention it. I don't think we can mention <laughs> the name, but it's, it's quite a sizable project. And we're already using, you know, some of the improvements from our initial big project in Lesotho. So with us, mm -hmm. when you be getting on the journey, you know, we, we be learning with the guys, we're on the ground because we want to get it right and make it to that high quality. So the project we're doing now, we're also learning, you know, getting all the stuff across the border. It's not the easiest thing there in yeah, the city, yeah. but, you know, we're making it work. And the, the scale these guys are doing is insane. You know, mm -hmm. like even the guys in South Africa, some of the facilities we've been to are proper GMP. And it's yeah. just so sad that they're not able to be to the point where the guys in the city are. So we're hoping that legislature finally gets into the groove where the guys can finally you know, reach their full potential. Yeah, no, I, I think we'll get there. Uh, Lesotho was, uh, had a little head start on us, but I think we'll be there soon. Yeah, enough. <laughs> cool and stuff, uh, guys. Cool, cool. Thank you so much for that, uh, Kaya. I um, really enjoyed that uh, interview. Always, It's always great to uplift our local manufacturers and get people out there, start buying some Mendo Sun lights. Um, so yeah. I forgot to mention initially in the beginning uh, that we were also going to be running a competition. Um, so right, right across the screen there, you'll see there's three prizes there. Mm. So essentially the one prize is our Grow uh, Happy Indoor uh, prize, which happens here in Ravonia um, at our campus, um, uh, the first uh, cannabis campus in Africa. And it's hosted by the Green Munchkin and uh, Cuban Zulu. Um, so if you are in town and you are here in Johannesburg, then this is, uh, this is a prize that you could potentially win. And then for those who are not based here, because I did see some people who are from Poland and Arizona and the US of A, um, we have a couple of courses which are known as our Cannabis Grow 101 and our Cannabis 101 course. The Cannabis Grow course basically talks about growing indoors and et cetera. Um, and our Cannabis course looks more for the medicinal side of things. But what we've done with these courses is that we've bundled them into Zoom classes. So then you get to interact with our subject matter, uh, subject matter experts around that. Also, guys, please feel free to start showing some, um, asking some questions on the side, which uh, Andrew will later um, ask uh, some of the, the panelists as we go on. So I think without further ado, let's bring on the panelists. And I'll see you later, Andrew. Have a good one, sir. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. All uh, panelists, you may uh, come off, uh, come on camera and reveal yourselves. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. We got one or two others. Uh, just to spare some time of everyone, uh, Anton, you were first uh, to come off camera. Do you want to quickly give a, a little bit of an introduction to yourself and energy wise? Thanks, Andrew. Yeah, how's it, guys? And uh, representing Earth Horticultural Light Systems from a tropical Durban. Um, it's great to be here. Thanks. So my name is Anton Human, and I've been a lighting engineer for the past seven years with EnergyWise, uh, working under Andrea Barraza. And um, as a company, we've been manufacturing and, and, uh, and understanding horticultural lighting for the last two years. And um, we've got some nice projects under the belt and 
be here to also bring South Africa up, bring the whole industry up. Fantastic. Uh, Lohan, uh, if you want to quickly just give yourself a, a quick introduction and uh, of Photronic. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is Lohan, and I'm from Cape Town. Um, I'm the co-director and co-founder for Photronic. Um, I've been into the electronics industry for about 12 years now. And since 2040, my main focus is LEDs. So basically, we started building horticultural lights about eight years ago, me and a friend of mine. Uh, back then, the COPS was very, very big. So we imported the first COPS, but then we, we, you had to use these things to, to be able to cool it down. So the process wasn't a good, a good idea to sell. And then basically, as time progressed, then the SMD LED started taking over the market. So then we gradually, gradually uh, went to SMD LEDs. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. And uh, lastly, uh, Kwanda, if you want to just quickly give yourself a uh, quick introduction. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Kwanda Mteto, Cuban Zulu. Um, I'm a grower. I'm not exactly uh, a lighting uh, engineer or technician. Um, I do, I have been growing for some time, so I do how, know how to use lights uh, to their full potential and um, harvest the clean uh, cannabis crop. So yeah, I'm the founder and grower for Cuban Zulu Grows, which is a craft cannabis brand. And um, we basically are just highlighting uh, Africa and the African cannabis industry, um, as well uh, trying to bring the end consumer a clean, um, authentic, uh, you know, African cannabis. No, no, uh, Kwanda, you're representing uh, the actual people at the end of this journey uh, tonight. So it's uh, more important than you, than you may think because that connection between manufacturer and end user is what we are, you know, and these things are helping to improve. And, you know, your hands-on experience is always leading back and helping everyone. Because at the end of the day, there's the technical guys, which uh, I even myself won't uh, dare to say that I'm as technical as uh, some of these manufacturers. So, Kwanda, you, you and me <laughs> might be together <laughs> on this. Um, but, yeah, no, we, we, get, we get other ones at the end of the day. With, with the lights in our tents. And uh, so I think we've got quite a lot uh, in common tonight. Uh, everybody, so thank you so much for coming on tonight and for being available to share your knowledge. Um, and I'm gonna jump off, uh, jump in with a question. Uh, and uh, I'm not too sure who's gonna answer it, but it's one of my, my passionate, quest, uh, passionate things that have been uh, bugging me for a while in the industry, and it is the grams per watt that we are seeing everywhere. Uh, it is just, you know, it's, I know it back in the day, there was a time when grams per watt was an indication, but I, I, I want to maybe try to see if this is an opportunity that we can do a little bit of uh, maybe education on why grams per watt uh, is not the best indication when looking for a light. And I think, uh, Anton, we had a conversation about it uh, a while ago. If you want to maybe give us a little bit of clarity on the, yeah, why consumers shouldn't be, should look past grams per watt as, a, as an indication. Um, look, I think tradition, traditional technologies like your HIDs and your H HPSs, They've, they've had a particular output that, that was very constant. And, um, and so, I mean, I come from commercial, retail, and industrial uh, lighting background. And we know that although, although in the past, everybody knew what a 60-watt bulb was or a 100-watt bulb was. And, and now that we're progressing into the LED mainstream, uh, people have still got that type of of ideology or that a, a bulb is a bulb and, and a watt is a watt. Whereas now in the LED scene, we're actually seeing almost annually, the LEDs are, are upping themselves, becoming more and more efficient. And, um, and through that process, we don't talk watts anymore because uh, it's an outdated, it's an outdated uh, metric. Now it's micromoles per second or micromoles per joule. And these, these factors 
account for the amount of intensity coming out per energy input. And so it allows us to, and so coming back to your question, why shouldn't we look at grams per what? The LEDs are, are getting better all the time. And so you can't be held back with, um, with a metric like grams per watt because it's gonna be a changing metric. It's gonna be a changing figure all the time. Nobody's gonna actually know what you are actually talking about because everybody's, everybody's different. Yeah, I, I wish it was that uh, simple. And there was, a, there, was a, uh, there was an Andrew a while ago who thought that was it. Um, you know, just get the maximum, maximum wattage, you know, 10,000 watt, you know, thousand watt lights and, you know, that's it. You, you know, you're good to go. You're going to get a thousand grams. Um, but as we all get a little bit more clued up on this, uh, it's, uh, evidently not. So there are some more factors, uh, that are needed things like, you know, you need to look at your PPFD your height, your efficiency, uh, you know, all of those sort of factors contribute into it. So when you guys are out shopping on the, uh, on the market for a light, try to just uh, watch out for some of the common tactics that uh, a lot of our friendly overseas suppliers um, tend to exaggerate, you know, a thousand watt, you know, like they, uh, this many LEDs or this, it's a, a lot more about the tech than specifically maybe just how much power is getting pumped into it. Uh, and we're getting some really incredible uh, stats here on the uh, poll with, uh, uh, do you use LED or HPS? Uh, it's 95% of the growers are growing under LED or, or uh, facilities that are joining tonight, which is very, very impressive um, that uh, to see. Uh, I didn't think it would be so. And I also wanted to add tonight that I'm not um, going to be saying anything negative about, uh, negative about HPS. It does still have its value and it does still have a lot of uh, tech in it. Um, but tonight's the, the focus is on the LED. But in conjunction with talking about power and how much uh, wattage is going into lights and things like this, and uh, Kwanda and Indoor, uh, I, I, one of you guys, if you can give us a little bit of um, insights, uh, maybe Kwanda, I mean, how are you coping with, with the load shedding at the moment? Um, sure, dude, it's hectic. Uh... I, the only way I'm coping was to basically allocate an, a budget um, for uh, inverters for backup power. Um, because without it, you know, like many times, you know, you think it's just the light that affects what's going on in your environment, but your fans, your extractors, yeah. um, air conditioners, everything switches off. Um, so, you know, from a grower standpoint, um, there also has been some new nutrients that I've seen out there. Um, well, let me not say nutrients, but like uh, additive. I don't know if anyone knows of a phenol pump, which is like chlorophyll B, and it basically uh, helps you if your plants are going into growth, decline and so forth. Um, so um, yeah, SCOM, it, the only thing you can do is backup power, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Indoor, do you have any advice for, you're obviously dealing with the, on the daily, you know, customers coming to you like, oh, you know, I want to go lighting. Yeah, you know, uh, would you have any I mean, advice that I, you're giving out? Sorry, yeah. Kwame and I actually had a discussion the other day at Chiba about um, load shedding. And like what it comes down to is pretty much, you know, if you are a small grower, you don't, you don't have enough um, power to back up you know you want to go for what's priority the first thing is ventilation you don't want to be moving or sitting in stagnant air and then besides for that if you want to fill up your light then you only use half or quarter power power of what's running you know so just to keep those plants awake to keep them alive if you are running off an inverter or a generator instead of running the full light system cutting down as mm -hmm. much as you can just to keep the the plants receiving some sort of further activity you know what i mean just keep them awake during that two hours of light um, yeah, yeah. If, if I'm not I'm mistaken, doing. if I'm not mistaken, it, they don't need much uh, to just stay in the cycle. It can you can almost bring it down to the the barest of bare minimums. Yeah, you know? yeah. Like two hundred new mall even. Yeah, yeah. very low. fantastic. Yeah. Low. yeah, I mean we're we're so, running we're running, we're running run, some sorry. indoor. I'm saying Go we're on. running yeah. some indoor uh, sunlight um, at the facility at um, Shiba Cannabis Academy, and you know we have put that plan into, into 
uh, into account that be it load shedding goes down, our backup power can only take so much. So, you know, we lower everything down. We switch on one strip as opposed to, uh, you know, the two other strips on the side on each uh, light, you know. Um, but yeah, basically, it's just about keeping the lights on. And, um, you know, for those that don't have those type of situation to do such, um, you want to always kind of, because of ESCOM, you want to plan your lights on during the day so that, you know, if you're able to open your windows yeah. or take your plants out just so that they stay awake and you don't, uh, you know, mess up that light, that life cycle of theirs and, you know, potentially put them into growth decline or, um, you know, worst case scenario, re -veg type thing um, because you're getting such uh, varieties in your lighting schedule because it's not like load shedding is at the same time every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Another, would never, another would... thing you could think about is yeah. if you're in the veg cycle of the plant, you know, you're pumping above 16 hours of light. If you're getting a two hour decrease in that, you're still above that 12 hour light cycle. You know what I mean? So during that, that stage of growth during veg, the load shedding is not too much of a stress. It might cause the inconsistency in the, the light pattern. But from mm -hmm. what I've seen, I haven't had any stresses from just letting the, the lights go with the load shedding, especially during vegetation. But yeah, like you say, when you come into mm. flower, you know, you don't want any disturbances. I mean, yeah. if I get load shedding at 2 a.m., it's also, it's not, I'm not gonna hit a generator on at 2 a.m., you understand? Yeah. So <laughs> I set, my, I set my, my timer to switch off just before 2 a.m. and then my dark period extends by like four or five hours, you know? Uh, so I'm getting more than 12 hours of darkness, maybe like 16, but that's just the one cycle. We have to remember yeah. that during flower, the dark part of the of of the grow is the important part. That's what um, kickstarts the flowering cycle and pushes it further and further into flower. Is the actual darkness as well? You know what I mean? That's the important part of it. Yeah. And one more thing. That's why we basically chose to design the um, new systems with the power bar, so that if your lights do go off for that period of time, most people will have let's say a thousand watt DE or something like that. You can't just switch that boy on. So yeah, we can yeah. switch on one row of the four. You know, that's why we made it super modular so that we took into account for the load shedding because, you know, you, at least it's in the correct position. You don't have to move anything or fiddle because, you know, yeah. the babies don't really enjoy that too much either. Yeah, so that's just... That's one of the things that uh, being a, a South African manufacturer, I mean, also I can imagine on the business side of things, uh, you know, you've got a production run going of, you know, a thousand lights or whatever. Now you're sitting in the dark for, you know, three hours a day uh, or, or more in, in some circumstances. So, I mean, it can have an effect on the business side of things as well, which is pretty, uh, I'm sure also pretty extreme for you guys getting started, but also adds that element like, when you're designing the lights, you're designing them primarily, I suppose, for a South African market and maybe in the future uh, to expand that market. But it's something that your customers are going to be looking for in, in South Africa. I mean, most of the guys are in LED. Everyone is experiencing load shedding in some way or another. And I don't know if it will be solved overnight. So it's, it's interesting that you guys also have to think about that process uh, when, when uh, designing these lights. And I've got some interesting, the poll I think has just closed out, uh, some interesting stats on the spend with uh, electricity. Some big spenders uh, spending over 2,000, 37% uh, over 1,000, 24% over uh, four, 500, and under 500 is 20%. Uh, so it just does also go to show that it doesn't really, you don't really have to be out of the park with a, uh, massive spend on your growth. You know, you can kind of get in on any sort of size grow and afterwards, you you know, you're going to get a grow at the end of the day. Um, anyway, moving on to uh, my next question that's been um, quite a, a common one in the, in the industry, maybe not so much anymore, uh, but we kind of, we've, you guys have all, I don't know all the lights that you guys are manufacturing and we've all migrated away from uh, what I like to call blurple, uh, the blue purple. Um, and Lohan, we had a, a chat about this uh, when we were at your facility uh, about the blue purple. And I was wondering if you just want to give a quick uh, 
a quick understanding to the audience, like why your lights aren't that blue purple color and uh, why they should be potentially avoiding that sort of uh, design. Okay, so basically, um, if you look at at the LED or at the at the, the light that's being emitted, so white light contains all the different colors of the spectrum. So basically, what purple is is they just took they just went and they just took um, basically the green part out of the light, and then you you are stuck with um, blue light and with red light, and when you combine the red and blue, then you get purple light. Mm. So that's the idea behind it. But now. What we have realized is that um, that plants doesn't behave and doesn't grow as nicely if you take away the just the, the green light. So plants mm. like to have the whole spectrum of lights because there is certain um, certain like um, there is certain wavelengths that the plant actually need that that mm. do photosynthesis. photosynthesis. Yes, thank you. Yeah, no, it's a, it's something that's had sort of been going around. Uh, and I think, I mean, from my sort of understanding is it's, uh, it is the older technology and it's sort of like how, how HPS is, has developed. I think LEDs develop. Um, I do believe there is uh, times when it could be of value. I think Anton, I, I, uh, I tore down on Blurple at one stage and I think you did uh, correct me. Uh, if for certain crops, if I'm not mistaken, yeah, we um, we we offer eleven different spectrums, and it's going to range from different crops and different stages of growth. Mm. Um, one thing about the purple is that it's the most energy efficient LEDs around. So when you look at uh, at at purple specs, they are they 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 a fair sight uh, more efficient than the white LED. And so if you've got like where they really come into their own is like in a in a greenhouse where you've got, or even in a tunnel where you've got natural white light coming in and you're just supplementing the extra photo period hours that are outside of the sunlight hours. You're supplementing that with the blurple and the blurple comes from science where that red spark and the blue spark are where the plants are the most photosynthet photosynthetic where they're most active under, under that nanometers of light. And, um, and so there, there's definitely science behind it and they are the most energy efficient. So you, your running costs will be the, the least amount if you are running those, eh? Yeah, no, I, I, it's quite a, a fascinating thing, but I, I suppose you still have to have the, um, if you are gonna go that, that sort of route, maybe you're in a different horticultural space, but watch out, I think there's still a lot of the, uh, the specific LEDs on the thing that makes composes that blue purple color that's maybe uh you can obviously find very dated technology in that space because it was the first on the market uh but if you are going to look at something in that uh visible color spectrum then you probably want to make sure that your chips are uh, as up to date as possible um thanks for that thanks for that guys uh, uh i was just thinking um maybe a little bit back to the the core of of uh the core of it and I, and I think we'll probably uh Kwanda, I'll come to you next but uh if I can jump to indoor and uh if you guys want to just give a quick understanding um I'm kind of going to bring this to what the consumers again are looking for at the end of the day but if you can give a little bit of understanding I know like uh, uh, there used to be like, uh, you know, the, the understanding, you can say, oh, just get a lux meter and you can just see how bright your light is. Uh, but I wonder if you can just give us a little bit of understanding why, you know, maybe you need to start looking at the PAR readings or the PPFD readings uh, or the EPAR um, is something, Nico, you mentioned about that extended range a little bit earlier. Uh, maybe that's something you guys can just give a little bit of a, uh, elaborate yeah, on. You know, like running those kind of meters, you know, they don't specifically work for light, you know, like a, a Lux meter or what is it? Like the ones you get on your phone. <laughs> the ones you get on your phone, the apps, etc. Yeah. <laughs> they can't pick up actual spectrum, you know, they can't pick up the actual photons that are being delivered, you know, from the light. Um, so where was I going with this? Sorry. Um, your question was asking about, is it necessary to have some sort of instrument is that what you're going yeah, for uh, yeah so sort of what the consumers would be looking for in at the end of the day you know are, are you going to tell them to go you know 
buy a light with a high lux reading or you're going to tell them to go get something with good par ratings uh, well you'd want to look at something that's got a par rating on it because the par is actually what the plant uses par is a is a is a range of frequencies from 400 to 700 nanometers that the plant uses for photosynthesis you, you know? can't necessarily see some of these wavelengths like the far mm. red for example if you walk yeah. into a room with just the far red on, you'll be able to visually see, but without it on, you won't see it, you know. But also, so like, Represent. as humans, we can't actually, we can't actually see the intensity of light, you know. So we right. do mm -hmm. need something that's going to tell us what kind of PPFD we we are working with at a at a certain distance from the lights, you know. So. Um, what you're looking at, you have to understand that PAR is the actual photosynthetic range of a light, you know, so like the photoactive radiation, photosynthetic active radiation. A plant yeah. or a light needs to have majority of the spectrum within that PAR range, right, to be an actual grow light. So that's the, the spectrum that the plants use. So when it comes to PAR and PPFD, you just want to make sure that you've got a full range PAR or like we said earlier, full white light, that's going to give you something. As close to the McCree action spectrum. Yeah, exactly. As close mm -hmm. to sunlight as possible. You know, mm -hmm. the best don't, results from this. Yeah, and don't look for human uh, <laughs> lumens because lumens yeah. don't necessarily make sense for plants. I know I've read that somewhere. Lumens are for humans. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so don't, uh, don't look at lumens. That's, the thing is, so we can't tell the intensity of light because if we had to turn a light brighter, right, our retinas actually start closing up and then the light actually just seems normal. You know what I mean? As with the uh, actual, uh, what do we call it, the spectrometer, we can actually see that intensity a lot better. No, you can basically hold it to the sun. Yeah. Mm. And it'll tell you exactly what the sun's doing, which is awesome to see. Mm. Yeah. Someday that sun's baking and <laughs> reading the light. Book. If I could just transfer that into a light, I'll be chilling. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's brilliant. Um, yeah, that that sort of that exactly sums it up. That uh, you know, we're looking for that usable spectrum of light uh for the plants you know it's not for what we want to experience you know like here in the house i want to have good lighting you know i want to be able to see what i'm doing and but my plants don't see the same you know we're not speaking you know we're not yeah, seeing the same yeah. thing and we're not using the same thing uh Kwanda, is that something that you're looking for when you're looking for a light uh on the market is is it something you're shopping around for you want to make sure you know good power ratings and and uh ppfds at different levels and such like that yeah, um, look, one of the things I look at is, um, you know, does it meet the bracket, first of all? Um, is it a full spectrum? And, um, you know, uh, of course, there's the energy part of it to think about. But, um, you know, basically, uh, something that I would like to see more in the market, especially from our local manufacturers, is an actual meter of some sort that is correct because the things that you know if it's not an app on your phone you've got to you know cough out two three thousand rand type thing um you know for a decent meter um but yeah basically um you want to you know speak to the right guys um support local go to indoor sun and um you know full spectrum is basically what i look for uh in terms of pars and all of that, I like to go for a light that I can I can kind of uh, you know change my output uh, mm -hmm. you know so that I can run it at a lower output for veg and increase it for flower and also something that you can implement some sort of like a crop steering uh, you know aspect with your light intensity. So if you can. Um, you know, variable settings. That's mm. that's whether it's uh, by you know switching off one strip, um, you know, or having you know like um, the modular uh, lights. Again, I'm referring to Intel Sun. I mean, they're doing really fantastic stuff. You know, you have you can. Uh, it's not just one button switches on everything. Um, so that's an important thing for me. 
Mm. Yeah, so it's it's one of those things, you know, it's like I can tell you're looking for a lot of utility in a light and a lot of functionality and like obviously reliability is like a huge thing at the end of the day for, for us in South Africa. We don't want to spend our money on something that's that's not going to last the, the test of time. Um, and I think that's, that's the, you know, in the audience, uh, judging on like electricity spends and things like, you know, where the market is, uh, where the audience is, I, a lot of this information tonight, you're going to have different groups that will apply uh, that knowledge to, you know, like your home growers, you don't need to go buy a quantum meter for your tent, you know, it's like 15k or whatever, or 10, 10 plus k for a, a meter, it's like it's, you don't need to, you know, and like, thankfully, I know all the, the uh, lighting guys are doing a lot of testing uh, on the lights that they're producing. Uh, so it's it's something that's coming out and like a lot of them have proper uh, heat maps and spread maps and uh, BBFDs, you know, laid out. So I think that is one of the things that our local guys are working on quite a lot. Um, Lohan, in, in terms of obviously we, we've we've spoken now like the the, the the usable spectrum and like we've, we've spoken a little bit about uh, the far red. Um, I know you guys, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you do have a, uh, have you got a few UV chips on some of your, your units and uh, why did you decide to go for that? Okay, so basically um, they, um, that people have, they have done studies in the past and they have seen that UVB will increase the THC, but by a small percentage. Um, so we have developed on our LED strips. We have a, we have a, we have a left a, a small space where you can actually clip on a UVB LED. Mm. Um, so what we found is that the the best range for the for for the UVB LED is 310 nanometers. The reason for that is that um, if you in in flower if you expose your your plant longer than 12 hours into UVB, you are basically nuking the plants. You, you are actually killing it. So you must be very careful to do not to go too much over when using UVB, basically. If, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's something that's quite uh, particular to cannabis. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hence why we don't have so much research on this mm -hmm. UV, uh, the this, this sort of the bluer side of the spectrum, uh, mm -hmm. far left or, or not. It's, it's quite specific to cannabis, yes. correct? Yes, that is correct. Um, um, it activates a certain gene response in, in the plant that produces more THC. Mm. That's, guys, this is why exactly why, you know, it, it irks me that we're not, we don't have that ability to have studied this for, you know, 10, 15 years, because it's like, these are the, the, the developments that we're only finding out now. And I, I do feel that other countries maybe have a different advantage on the development of things because, you know, they've had more time to actually put proper studies in. And like, as, as we've all seen, this, this is not just, you know, turning on light bulb anymore. This is like a science, you know, people have, uh, guys on this webinar have dedicated lives to LEDs and lighting and technology and spectrums. It's, it's far beyond, you know, the science is there and the studies need to be done. And like, I think there's a lot of, uh, I know for a fact that studies like that were blocked because of le legislation, um, not being able to just have a cannabis plant, put a light on it and shine, like you can do your tests and see if there's you know, benefits down the line. And that even that wasn't allowed for a long time. So I think hopefully, small rant, but hopefully we'll get to a uh, time and a place where we can be doing those tests uh, in South Africa and actually using that knowledge and maybe actually contributing to the global uh, knowledge base in uh, cannabis and also just uh, horticulture as a as an entire um, agricultural uh, as an entire. So uh, we've got a poll uh, coming up. Uh, most of the audience uh, were unaware of far red um, uh, coming in at 52% and 36% were, and uh, <laughs> there's 11% uh, understand far red as uh, it's when my eyes go red from, <laughs> from a bad soul. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I did know that far red first before I knew uh, the other far red. Um, <laughs> uh, things about, uh, speaking of eyes, um, 
And something that, uh, uh, Kwanda, you might be able to give us a bit of info on, um, is there like some sort of, uh, I know it's not just LEDs uh, per se, but is there any safety precautions that we should be making use of in uh, our LED spaces? Yes, definitely. Um, uh, cultivation glasses, uh, get one specifically for LED. Um, if you check online, there's a number of different companies that are doing such. Um, uh, you know, on your home grow, you know, you, it depends how big your home grow is, actually. Some people have a tent, some people have a whole garage. But mm. if you're going to be spending prolonged times, uh, prolonged periods, uh, you know, working on your plants, which most of us will do, especially if you want to, you know, cultivate a good crop, it's extremely important. It may not, uh, you know, if affect you immediately, but over time it does affect you. And, you know, you don't want to be coming into your older age and uh, struggling to see because you've spent all that time growing cannabis indoors. Mm. And um, yeah, like, um, you know, you've said many times, a lot of the spectrums we don't actually pick up with our eyes. Um, but the fact is, it is an artificial source of, you know, lighting and it's meant for, it's, it's aimed at uh, giving the plants the best that it can get. So um, in terms of our eyes and the plants, it's a different thing. Um, mm -hmm. Protect your yeah. eyes. 100% agreed. Uh, uh, on top of um, uh, something else that I wanted to mention. Uh, so we've spoken about safety and I mean, I, that is obviously evident. Uh, and I'm going to like swing the conversation right back to manufacturing and uh, sort of pick off where we started again with the locality of things. And uh, Anton, you might be able to give a bit of insight um, more on the uh, more on your job as as uh, designing these lights and coming up with these lights and being you know connected to manufacturing. What is oh. it going to take for South Africa South Africans? to get LED lights to the same competitive price as some of the internationals. Um, obviously, barring sort of the, the ones that are coming in like egregiously cheaper than anyone can ever make a light. Um, but say our European uh, partners, um, what, what, what sort of things are we going to have to you know, in terms of your side, is it maybe uh, additional manufacturing equipment? Is it additional resources, human uh, human uh, capacity, or is it something that the consumer can actually take into their hands in terms of produce, uh, buying local, for instance? Um, look, if you, there, there's a range of products in the market and it, and it really depends on, on you as the end user, where you want to go and fish for your product. Um, the, in, in, within Energy Wise and the Earth Horticultural Projects, we only buy European uh, LED boards and, and LED drivers. Um, they, they've got a heritage of, of, um, of great proportion coming from Europe. They've been tested. They come with um, lifetime graphs and, and data. And, uh, and so one in order to upskill the whole, the whole industry, um, laboratories are where you can, you can test, you can see whether, whether your equipment's coming from, from the East or Europe or the West, you are able to test for yourself what, how it's working. Um, you, if you get quality equipment, uh, quality components, then they come with lifetime graphs. You get to be able to understand and have confidence in uh, how long a fitting is going to last. When we design and we and we are and we designing for a client spec, I will design for his spec at the end of my five-year warranty period. Mm -hmm. So, so it's that kind of confidence that we've got. Um, that and so for me to bring the whole industry in South Africa up, we're going to need to have some maybe talking between companies and. Um, and, and utilizing the, the technology that's available to, to standardize a standard and, 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 make, and make South Africa great. All of our products, mm. you know, just raise the whole bar. 
Do you think uh, it'll come a time when the European uh, sort of uh, manufacturers and the uh, American guys and maybe even some of the East suppliers uh, and manufacturers, do you think it'll ever come a time where they're just going to set up shop in South Africa and uh, use it as this network? Because, I mean, obviously, we're sitting on a very lucrative position with our uh, possible route into Africa as South right. Africa as being maybe the hub. But do you think they're going to make, do you think they're going to try step in on, on our turf? Flip, it's all to be seen. Um, there's definitely a capital investment that's required. Um, they seem to be producing for the world from wherever they are. So, so I, personally, I don't see the big houses coming here, um, which is great for us local manufacturers. We've got all the components from wherever we, we choose to source and, and, and we put out the products that, that we're very proud of. So price-wise, I think it's really down to where you're sourcing from mm -hmm. and um, how much engineering goes into it and, and, and the product you put out. Uh, yeah. you, can, you can choose where you want to be on the spectrum, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, 100%, I agree. I, th I think it's going to take... Uh, it's going to take that time, you know, as we spoke about earlier, it's, it's, it's not, our industry is a little bit behind, not, not in necessarily in knowledge and uh, understanding, but in terms of the capital investment, you know, it's a huge amount of money that needs to go into getting these facilities off the ground. And, you know, it's a lot of the times it's, it's like, uh, only possible because of sort of pivots on original things. And, and uh, it's a, just an immense uh, mountain to climb. It's not manufacturing on a small scale. It's, it's like LEDs. It's a, it's a complicated process. I've had the privilege of visiting a lot of your uh, guys' facilities. And it's a complicated process to, to get to where you guys are. So I do commend you guys on that. And I'm going to jump into sort of a last question um, sort of thing. And... Uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, if uh, anyone's aware of, I'm sure you guys probably are, but I was uh, doing a little bit of research and sort of, I was reading about daily uh, light integral and it really kind of just, I had a, a, a brainwave and I was like, oh, you know, I've never really looked at it in that sort of uh, understanding, you know, I've been taking uh, PBFD readings and, you know, I've understood that and I know like my far reds and UV and I've always sort of looked at it as like a moment in time, you know, just that second, like what is my PBFD at this height, uh, you know, in this space, in this corner of my tent. Um, I don't know, uh, you guys at uh, Indoor, do you have any sort of understanding of the uh, daily light integral? Um, yeah, yeah. So DLI, daily light integral, is pretty much the amount of photosynthetic active photons that are being delivered to an area in a 24-hour period. That's pretty much the, the understanding of it. Um, different, I would say different plants, different cultivars also react differently to different DLIs. Mm. Um, what, what more could I say? Like you said, uh, so the DLI is basically pretty much your your PPFD, but a 24 hour cycle of it and just yeah. understanding how useful that, that, that light within those 24 hours is to your plant. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's because of one of the highest DLIs. That's what the guys are using, utilizing it for mainly greenhouse projects and such. Well, yeah. It's yeah, that, that was one of the things I think because I've maybe uh, been so restricted in, in uh, LEDs and it's like, Obviously, all of you guys LEDs are putting out. It's not, you know, a stable PVF, a uh, stable par. Uh, it's not really changing. Um, whereas, like, if you think of sort of uh, a greenhouse sort of environment, that's where it really is going to actually play a role. Because you go out with your your meter and you're like, hmm, okay, cool. This is my readings, but you actually need a sort of. Uh, and I'm sorry about the home growers. This maybe is yeah. is sort of on the applies on the bigger scale, but. You need to sort of look at it over the whole day, you know, how much did they absorb? Uh, and I thought that was yeah, really yeah. interesting. But also, um, so like a little bit of input here as well. So like mm. if you're growing indoors, right? And you're growing um, photo plants, right? 
versus uh, autoflower plants. Your DLI is a lot different because your autoflowers you can run a lot longer. You know, your light can be on mm -hmm. a lot longer. But that also doesn't mean your PPFD is sitting at the same level as a photo period plant. You're actually sitting a lot lower in terms of PPFD because you're allowing the DLI to be more. You understand the, the, the time frame of light for that plant to capture that light is being extended in terms of an auto flower, right? So yeah, you yeah. kind of minimize, or you don't minimize your PPFD, but you've lowered it compared to a photo plant, you understand? Yeah, because yeah. The light cycle of the plant. Yeah. I didn't even think of that. Brilliant, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. So uh, just Linda, to pull up that, that actual <laughs> minimal DLI range, you know, so mm, the mm. plant does does require a minimum DLI, you know. Yeah. And in terms of, let's say, a, fo a photo, let's say you're sitting at about 40, 45, whatever, and an uh, autoflower is sitting at 60, the PPFD on the autoflower is a lot lower compared to the photo because you've extended it for so much longer. The plant only requires that much in that amount of time. Mm, 100%. Yeah. Awesome, Linda? awesome stuff. Thank you so much, guys. Um, my brain is a little fried at the moment because uh, there was a lot of information there and I think I have to watch back the video, which will be available on our YouTube channel uh, most probably next week. So if you guys missed anything or want to recap, please go and watch that. Um, also, I have the two winners of our prize. All right, are you ready? <laughs> uh, Spumzo. Magabuka from Eastern Cape, you win yourself either the Indoor Grow uh, course or one of the bundle courses that we mentioned here, which is the Cannabis 101 and the Cannabis Grow course. Uh, Matthew Craig Griffiths from the Claim Karoo, uh, you also have won yourself a prize of the three, depending on which one. So we'll holler at you guys uh, later on during the week and then just see what your preference is and uh, yeah, and get that uh, sorted out. Also, guys, this is us coming to an end of our um, program, but we do have a little time for some Q&A. So if anyone who's out there who's got a burning question that they really want to ask, ask uh, our esteemed uh, panelists, now is the time to ask. I'll have to, uh, <laughs> I'll have to put my uh, uh, questions on hold as well. I'll give the audience a chance. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you have your own questions. No, oh, no, 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 it's the audience's turn now. I could ask questions all day. <laughs> I don't see any questions on the, I mean, I have, I mean, I don't see any questions on the, on the chat. Um, I think, yeah, Andrew, I think go, go for it. Ask, ask a question. Okay. So I think, uh, 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 Anton, maybe I'll give you an opportunity on this one, just in, in short, uh, I also I was saying, we, you know, we've been on a little bit of the topic of greenhouse and your DLI. Um, I just wanted to, maybe you could shed a little bit of light on, on, uh, on absorption in sort of your, for instance, your greenhouse uh, and how different, you know, there's going to be a difference on your, your sort of readings in greenhouse and out greenhouse and how, you know, how important it is to factor in that absorption uh, rate of the material sure um so i think a lot of the the greenhouses absorb the blues and the uvs uh which is why the guys like to throw a little bit more blue and uv back in there um but like your your tunnel material is quite radical in that it it diffuses light so well that you don't get shadows anywhere so if you've got lights in there for extra for extra daylight um it's quite nice that that you're able to kind of eliminate the shadow effect. Um, in a greenhouse, you have to be quite cognitive, cognizant of, of shadow and, and how much shadow you're going to put over your plants. Um, a lot of the guys put lights directly under the beams. Um, but then you're so far away from the plants that you've become yeah. quite inefficient uh, in the amount of intensity that actually reaches the plants. Um, but yeah, in the bigger grows, if you've got those par senses and you're able to understand for yourself what you're getting, then then you're able to make the adjustments and and only use the yeah. light that's required. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's one of those things we need the access to to data and uh, well, not access, but if we have access, 
take the data, log the data. You know, we always push it on our, our channel. Like if you're able to set up a grow now, log your, your grow, you know, set that, record the data because we, we the pioneers of this next, uh, you know, next growth in the industry. We're the ones in 10 years time are going to be like, oh, now I've got 10 years of data on my grow, you know, like I know this works because I've tried this light and I've, or I've manipulated the nutrients in this way or, or, you know, these genetics and things like that. So uh, I always encourage some data. That's a bit of a, a tangent. But yeah, one thing also on that absorption is, is it just like hit me like, you know, you get, uh, it's something like 20 or 23% extra um, efficiency you can get by just cleaning the top glass on your greenhouse, which I thought was like, I didn't even, yeah, you know, uh, it's like, uh, I lead you guys, you know, I know you guys fight for uh, like percentages efficiency over, you know, over the five year span, but there are other factors that can supplement your uh, lighting, which you can, you know, have an impact on as, you know, those sort of environmental controls. I thought was really interesting. Um, and Linda, I'm going to... So Andrew, we have one, one, one question yes. uh, from Christina Love, which is a very interesting question, which is about what is uh, the future of solar power lights? Ooh, uh, Lohan, have you done any uh, solar uh, fixtures or, or do you think it's going to be a, a possibility down the line? And thank you, Christina, for that wonderful so question. Basically... Um, for for solar power lights, so that's basically light that that oh yeah. So it's a weird question. So um, basically, we we are, we we are busy quoting on two two grow rooms that needs solar, and they want to go full off the grid for the solar installations. Mm -hmm. But but to basically yeah. So but the thing is, you need, you need a lot of um, a lot of power to be able to power your lights mm -hmm. and your whole indoor facility. Um, mm -hmm. and also, and it's not only about, um, going, if you want to go full solar or do you want to supplement with ESCOM? Um, so basically it's very difficult and because the cost gets very big when you, when you go, go with solar because of the batteries. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the biggest cost of the whole solar is batteries. Yeah. That, that initial capital to get it off the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's. It's uh, I mean, I like everyone, everyone here knows like, cause we've gone through load shedding when we've Googled like, oh, you know, you can get an inverter for like 700 bucks, but then time goes to get a battery, you know, it's like, now it's like two and a half K, three K for like a little battery. That's going to get your laptop going. Now it's like, I oh, just, you know, come, come couple like 4,000 Watts of LED in the garage as well. It's like, you know, it's a whole different ball game. Mm. Um, so I do hope that we get yeah. to a point where solar so, can, so, it'll so to, phase in. So to give you a rough um, um, idea, um, we just quoted for a solar job for 150 kilowatt of, of, um, of LEDs. And the, the, so the quote came, came up to about 7 million, just oh. 150. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a hefty one, but I think well, as the tech changes, let's hope we get to a little bit of a a mashup of eco and uh, efficiency at the same time. And we've sure, always got the sure. sun. For <laughs> you sure, know, exactly. This, this, yeah, the sun is for free. That's what I was thinking. But then again, <laughs> if you're in South Africa, you're gonna have to pay for that sun sometimes. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> without further ado, guys, thanks so much for the attendees for coming through and with your amazing questions and uh, attention. Um, also, the panelists, guys, thank you so much. Hope to see you guys again later. And Andrew, for being such an amazing host for My One SA, thank you, thank you so much, my brother. Hope to do this again with you. And uh, for everybody else out there, please check your emails. We've now got your details. We'll send you some more uh, information about our next webinar, which is taking place next month. And there's a few others that will be coming back because we're back and uh, we're an attack as Chiba Cannabis Academy. We are sharing the knowledge of growing and we all want to grow together. Have a great night. Peace out to all of you and drive safe and uh, take cannabis responsibly. <laughs>